Today we have Matt Rosenberg on the podcast. Mountaineer, good friend in college, had a slight bromance, no homo. Um, big bromance. Big bromance. Yeah, dude, we, you, actually, you actually helped me rehab to like be able to not or to be able to walk without crutches in Alaska. I got you, dog. Yeah. I still have those socks you gave me. I what what, I, what socks did I give you? They say Alaska on them. Do they? Yeah. I got you a gift? No way. In Alaska, yeah. You came back, you're like, bro, I got you these socks. And they're, they're like they have Alaska on them. And like a picture, like it's like a print on there. Yeah. Do I am such a good friend. God damn. You're a great friend. All right, man. Uh, so after college, kind of give me a rundown of like what happened. You went out to, I don't. I went out. Mount. So I went to college and yeah. I, uh, after that, I basically knew that I wanted to be a guide. So I went and tried out for a guiding company in Washington on Mount Rainier, yep, which is that's right. a huge, huge, huge mountain in the U S here. It's like, uh, it's the biggest mountain in the United States outside of Alaska. Um, Denali. Outside of Alaska, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I made it. And so I've been guiding on Rainier for the last four years. Um, and in the last two years, I've been guiding internationally in Argentina, Nepal, um, yeah, you and Alaska. What? How, how do you work for a company that, like, affords you to go to all these places or how does how like how are you able yeah. to afford like that's insane so i work for a company called alpine ascents international um they are a mountaineering expedition outfitter so people pay them pay us to gotcha. take them up mountains that's super dope have you had like any uh, have you had any like celebrity clients or anything like that well that you're allowed to talk I about i haven't but there have been <laughs> at the company for sure that's so crazy so when did like other than getting into it after college, had you, I mean, I knew you were, you uh, were super into skiing and everything. So like, was that kind of always the plan after college to go and do that or what? No, uh, you know, I kind of, I wanted to go to college and do the degree thing and start a career, um, in what my degree was in, but I just, I couldn't do it, man. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man. You know, the thought of working behind a desk just scared the living crap out of me. So really, do you ever think you'd do it? Work behind a desk? Yeah. Do you ever think you would? Someone paid me a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Wow. That's so funny. So, I mean, to like, I feel like you have definitely the most underrated Instagram for like an explorer or whatever. Cause every time I, I'm serious. Every time I, I see your Instagram, it's absolutely bonkers. You, you just ha- take these bangers after bangers, after bangers of being on mountains every single Thanks, day. Man. Like I'm, yeah, I'm literally out my shit right now. I just was on uh, the highest peak in Mexico or It's 18,400 feet. Uh, it's the third highest mountain in North America. Uh, I'll be posting stuff about that climb. That was five days ago. I climbed that. So, be posting stuff about that all next week. That's uh, and I I've caught you just in this window where you're between Mexico and Moab. So like yes. so here's the real question. I imagine you're calling like the West Coast home base for you. Is do you have like one yeah. like home base? Like where I guess where is home for you? Uh Seattle. Seattle's home for me. Um so the company is based in Seattle. Everyone does time on Mount Rainier. Um, that's like kind of the bread and butter of this, uh, company that we're actually we're for two companies, but the main one that I could you scoot back uh, a little bit or because oh, yeah. your head's like cut off. That's better. I can tilt it as well. Yeah. That's, a, that's perfect. Yep. Um, cool. so yeah, everyone, everyone does time on Mount Rainier. So when I'm not like in Alaska or Nepal or any of those other places, I'm here in Washington. Um, and usually I would be in Argentina all winter, Yeah. but because of COVID, um, I will be ski patrolling at a resort this winter. Where at? Crystal Mountain Ski Area in uh, Washington. What, dude? I, I, I swear, I, I have to come out and visit you. There's like, yeah, you should. It's been so long. It's it's literally been what three, four years. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I can't even. 
wow, three or four years. I mean, don't get me wrong. My, my leg still kind of sucks. And, but, like, actually, I've been running. Like, this outfit, this is, like, my running outfit. So I'm, like, preparing to go run. And I, I was, like, getting ready to go run. And I was like, oh, I got a podcast to do. And then I realized uh, I had to come talk to you. But, yeah. Sorry. No, it's all. Hey. Brutal. <laughs> hey, no, it's what we're here for. Um, yeah, dude. What is what has been like one of the more like intensive or intimidating climbs that you've been on? Like what, uh, like whether it's just a, a climb that you've done on your own personal end, or maybe uh, a climb that you've done with clients. Oh man, um, I can answer that question in two ways. I think the first, I would say, probably uh, an actual physical climb was probably my, uh, my, my, I'm sorry, my Nepal trip last year. Um, yeah. just because that was my very first international lead mm. and not that the climb itself was difficult, but as a guide, uh, my climbing isn't necessarily like high technical, um, acumen. It's, it's much more <laughs> like soft skills. Um, the climbing is, you know, many of the clients would have, a. Uh, uh, tough time organizing being fit enough um getting everything up there knowing where to go like all these different things like without guides um but um what's hard for me as a guide is um the logistics of it so it was intimidating like going to a country i've never been before climbing a mountain or climb before wow. working with a staff i've never worked with before clients i've never met before um and now i'm leading this trip you know and so i'm in charge of uh, like a, a professional staff of three climbing Sherpas, um, maybe like three oh. or four cook staff. Um, yeah. I think there are three or four porters and like 12 donkeys. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then of course the four clients. So that's intimidating. That's, that's a month long expedition to a 24,000 foot mountain in far Western Nepal. That's intimidating. <laughs> I mean, you start putting the, uh, the numbers. Yeah, you're going to be intimidating anyone. I mean, even just the, the common person. Like, I, most of the people who are, watch this podcast, I imagine they know just as much as I know about mountaineering, climbing, mm -hmm. and what it takes to do, like, a, a full expedition of, like, what you're doing. Like, it's it, it, seems, it seems so, I guess, out of this world, like, you know, this like obviously this is gonna be complimentary, but like when I when I think of Matt, like when I think of you, I'm like, there's the, you have like this kind of like Superman aura about you that like you can do anything at, at like no stop, whatever it is, you're just gonna go for it and like you're just gonna kick ass doing it. Man, you just nailed it right in the head, bro. Thanks. That's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, you know, you'd be surprised. It's there's a lot of resources out there um, for this type of stuff. Like, let's say I wanted to go and do an expedition back to that peak that I did just now, or a Saba. You know, I mean, it's as easy as getting on the internet and starting to buy plane tickets. Cool. Now I've got my plane ticket to Mexico. How am I going to get to the base of the mountain? What's at the base of the mountain? Is it a town? Is it yeah. a company I'm going to go meet up with? Um, research the mountain. What do I need? What do I need to bring to the base to start this climb? I mean, these are the things you just break down and you start to tick off everything and eventually yeah. you realize like, man, there's actually a lot of resources out there. I can go to the base of this mountain and hire porters or, uh, get transportation to and from, or, you know, there's in many places, like, especially in Nepal, there's like a thousand trekking companies that you can go and work with. Uh, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But I wanted to tell you, so I think actually one of the more intimidating parts of it, uh, was becoming a guide. If you think of that as a climb, I, uh, you know, yeah. trying out was tough. Um, and then working for the first company that I worked for, I won't name them cause I'm about to talk some smack, but <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it's a great company with great people, excellent sure. guides, excellent, yeah. uh, people all around, not the right company for me. Um, and working there was really hard. They have a, a very, uh, militaristic style, um, almost like fratty, if you will, like if they've been on <laughs> the mountain that they guide on for many, many years. So yeah. they have a lot of traditions. Um, and it, it was hard socially to adjust to being in like a climber type 
uh, I don't know how, how do I put this? Um, it was hard. It was hard to, it was hard to kind of get in. Um, and I, I ended up leaving that company and working for Alpine Ascents, the company that I'm with now. And I feel yeah. so at home here. Um, so that was hard. You know, so you know how I told you I moved to Dallas, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I moved down to Dallas. I took, I took a job down there. Um, I'll tell you later, like kind of about what I did. Uh, but it was so hard for me down there to like meet people, make friends, build relationships. And like, that was really one of the biggest reasons why I moved back to Indiana, just because like I wasn't meeting anyone. Uh, I was so far away from family, more or less homesick. And like, it was just almost miserable, uh, like going home every day and just be like, cause I was just doing the same thing, working out, uh, like when I get home, maybe do a little something, this, that, the other. Like I, I really oh, that's really bad mentally too, huh? Yeah, it was, it was, it was very taxing because it was just, it seemed like it was. I don't, I don't know how to put it. It just, it, it really just seemed like I was on an island, and like my, I guess my question is for you. This doesn't really pertain to mountaineering, but um, how are you able to get connected um, out in? like the Seattle area or making friends, especially like trying to make friends when it seems like you're always on the move, you're in different countries, you're doing everything. And it's just, I feel like it's hard to like maintain that. Like how, how, how did you start it? And then how have you maintained it? Hmm, man, that, that's a weird, that's an interesting question. Cause I did come out here like not knowing anybody, but, um, creepy style i knew a guy that worked at the first company that i worked at and i purposely i knew of him he's very famous okay and i made sure to go and work at a ski resort that he also worked at okay. knowing that i would meet him there and <laughs> no that's not creepy at all that's like that's like, that's strategic me, help me out and yeah. uh, and he did and i got hired and that's kind of how i got my in but then um you know in this community it's like if you can work your ass off and shovel your ass off and carry a lot of weight, people will know you and respect you. Um, and, yeah. and you can make friends a little really easily that way. As opposed to if you do not work hard, <laughs> <laughs> you will have a lot of enemies quickly and people will True. forget about you like that. Gotcha. That's, that's so interesting. So would you say like, I mean, even, even when I first met you, you were definitely like very, like you're very ca- charismatic. You're very outgoing and like, Thank you. We no, I, I'm just being honest. Like we we like whenever I first saw you, I was like, this guy's a douchebag. He's a tool. Like that was that was my honest thoughts. But then then it yes, turned out you're just I like a really cool yeah. guy. So the look I'm going for is uh, the tool bag. <laughs> well, I think so. I've told you that you kind of look like Conor McGregor of sorts. But then you showed me a picture. Oh, that guy's my idol. I love that guy. <laughs> Do you? Hell yeah. Uh, I'm not going to sit here to lie to you. I'm a, I'm a fanboy of Conor McGregor myself. Uh, you see his movie? Yeah. Uh, what, I can't remember what the name Victoria. of it is. Yep. Yep. Saw it. Shameless yeah. plug. Awesome yeah. fucking movie. Yeah. It, it was pretty good. I'm not going to lie. But the, but kind of going back to who you look like, and then you were like, you showed me a picture of Brett Favre and I was like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I could kind of see the, uh, the old Brett Favre maybe when you get into your later years for sure. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, that's so crazy. Um, so when you're, when you're going, um, and you're traveling to these different places, I imagine, I don't know how many different languages you, you speak, but, um, <laughs> just, how, one. just one, just English. Uh, yeah. so I imagine you're having translators with you when you're trying to, uh, get to the base of the mountain or what, like do the Sherpa speak English? You know, many people that work in the uh, tourism industry in these different countries all speak English. Um, really? When I'm in Argentina. Oh, yeah. When I'm in Argentina. Because that's, you know, that's where the clients come from for the most part is the United States. Um, all white people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, pretty heavily, it's pretty heavily white men. Um, and these are yeah. statistics that you can find on, like, American Mountain Guiding Association website information. Gotcha. Like, this is stuff that we actually keep track of. Um, it's mostly white men. Um yeah. And when I mean like in Argentina, there's uh, heavily, heavy, heavy English speaking um, culture in the industry um, yeah. and in, in Nepal as well. But that part is tough. Um, you know, like when I was in Nepal, it's like 
my one my one guy would speak English, and then he would like tell everybody else what I've asked for or told them to do. So that was always gotcha. kind of an interesting way to communicate. Gotcha. Uh, have you, I guess, on the mountain, like what has been? Have you ever had like an oh shit moment where you like you made a wrong step or you made a wrong move or maybe a, a piece of equipment malfunctioned? And, like, has has anything like that happened to you or like with your clients? Of course not. Everything is always perfect. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we both know that's one such time. a lie. <laughs> now, one time I was climbing, um, I was guiding a rod on Rainier, and <clears throat> I was putting in. If you can imagine this, I'm, uh, it's dark, completely dark. I only have my headlamp. Um, wow. I've climbed to the base of, we're at about 12,000 feet. And I've climbed to the base of a, like a, an ice pitch. Uh, so about 300 feet of ice. That's not quite vertical, but it's like you're using the front points of your crampons. So you've got uh, big boots on with spikes on them. And in the toe, there's two there's two points that come off the toe of each boot. And so you can use those to walk up vertical ice, right? Um, and I've got two ice axes. So I'm, it's easy graded, but it's still steep. If you were to fall, you would for sure die. Um, wow. Like you would, yeah, you'd be gone. Um, I was doing what's what we call rope soloing, which is where basically I'm dragging the rope because I have two clients on the end of the rope um, who are anchored off separately. Does that make sense? So they're sitting there. They're safe. Even if I fall yeah. and die, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> they're anchored to their, their, to their own thing. Gotcha. Um, and so I'm climbing up the pitch. I climb solo. I don't put any protection in. I just climb, um, dragging the rope behind me until I get to the end of the rope, basically. Jeez. And now I'm, so now I'm up there. I've got four pieces <laughs> of steel into the wall on my feet. And I put in one ice axe um, that I can hang on on my arm. And now I can have my other hand free. I just put the axe in the wall and leave it there. Um, and then I start to screw in two ice screws to make an anchor. And this is like blue ice. And I put in the first one, all is well. I put in the second one, and I hear this loud thunk crack. And I immediately can tell that I'm on, basically standing on a huge flake, like, like if it had been daylight, you could probably see like a like a like a line in a big circle kind of around me. <laughs> this large flake, this large like leaf of ice that I'm just kind of like stuck to <clears throat> could basically at any time just peel off with me on it. Um and off I go. So I'm like, oh, okay, back <laughs> this screw out, clip back on, back this screw out, grab my axe slowly move over, do the same thing, and it was all good on the other side. It oh. was stressful. It was very stressful for five minutes there, moving the screws around and moving over. Oh, my goodness. Matt, come on, man. Yeah. But and then all the time, there's, I mean, definitely on, on certain routes, there's rock fall hazard and stuff. I mean, I've come within six foot of, like, a basketball-sized rock that's, like, whizzing down. Like, oh. whizzing down. But that's that's just being in the mountains. I, yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I get like, what, what I have to know. What is, why do you keep doing it? What's, what's the rush? Like what, like, I don't Uh, understand. It's not a rush. It is definitely a business decision. I I really enjoy climbing and I want to get paid for what I'm good at and like to do. Um, I mean, that's, that's completely fair. That's what I do. Now, I, to say that I do it for the great, great money is not true because it's not great money. But, <laughs> gotcha. you know, I because of this job, I'm in, like, the best shape of my life almost all the time. And I get to travel I would imagine it's incredible. It's really nice, you know. Like, I, you know, in a certain way, I get paid to be fit. Um, and You're almost uh, a professional yeah, athlete. It's, it's, athlete. I mean, I, I would, you know, I would definitely say you're a professional athlete. No, you know, I, I, when I was a firefighter, uh, we would say – you're a uh, an occupational athlete. An occup- okay, because it's an actual job. I think job. that's more accurate. Yeah, I mean, like I'm not a professional mountaineer. I'm a mountaineering professional. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, like you know, like I'm not the guy that's gonna take you up El Capitan. There are my friends could for sure, but I'm not like oh. the technical wizard. Um, but I'll definitely take you up Mount Rainier, Denali, Everest, things like that. So, you've been up Everest, right? 
I have not been up on Everest. Is it on the list or no? Oh, absolutely. That's man. You can make so much money climb like guiding on Mount Everest. The first year guide on Everest could expect to make probably 10 to 15 grand. Like in for three one... months, that's oh. a lot of money. Then you come back, uh, and it's, you know, may do a Denali, come back and finish up on Rainier. You could pretty much F gotcha. off for the rest of the winter, man. Wow. So, a I'm, lot of us guys think very seasonally. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like honestly, spring, I think that's the way to this. do it. It's summer, I think it's the, time for this. It's winter. It's time for that. I, I think that's. I mean, I think it's definitely the, the way to do it. I mean, I imagine. What do you? What do you? Do you? Do you look at the seasons more as like winter and summer, or do do you really see fall and spring in there, or what? Oh yeah, you know, fall is. Well, you could talk to different people, and they probably give a different answer. But like here in oh, Washington, sure. fall now. Rock climbing season. Me and all my friends are heading to the desert. <laughs> um, gotcha. We're going to Utah and stuff, and I'm about to leave to go to Utah tomorrow with my girl. And um, and then winter is uh, usually when we go down south, guiding in South America or ski guiding around here, uh, which is what I'm going to probably move towards. I think with this COVID stuff, and I um, just want to be in Washington. Um, yeah. And I ski patrol, so that's. A lot of us ski patrol as well as ski resorts. And then spring, alpine climbing, summer, mountaineering. What's alpine climbing? Uh, it's like, I, like alpine climbing would be like mixing mountaineering, ice climbing, rock climbing, skiing, like kind of just all disciplines. Um, imagine like something like the Matterhorn. Or, uh, you, know, you probably wouldn't know. The, do you know the Eiger? You've heard of the Eiger? I've heard of Bob Iger, the Disney guy, <laughs> the Disney former Disney when CEO. Like a, when you think of like the most badass mountain you can imagine, yeah, that's alpine climbing. It's cold, snowy. You're like doing rock moves. You also have a nice axe. There's a rope on you. Gotcha. As opposed to like a glacier slog, um, that's more of like an endurance challenge, like Mount Rainier. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you you talked about El Capitan earlier. Um, yeah. Have you watched the movie called Free Solo? Yes, I have. Just the opening of that movie alone. My hands are sweating, my palms are sweating because this yeah, guy, uh-huh. guy I, awesome. I, I what do you know what, what his name is? Alex Handold. Yeah. Alex Handold. <laughs> Alex Handold. Like Alex Handold. <laughs> what I don't know what it is. I'm literally going off of what you're telling me because I can't remember. I, I just remember uh, like watching the movie and seeing that this guy, this crazy dude, is going. Oh, I think it's so free solo. It's like uh, don't 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 correct me when I'm wrong. Just let me try to get this. Uh, I'll out. do my best. I mean, that dude's a different level. Well, I'm I'm trying to say so. It's like unassisted, no ropes, um, and you're ju- you just have like what you got on you. Basically, it's just like no no aids at all, right? Right. That would be like a free a free solo, yeah, a free climb. Well, free. There's so many terms. I don't even know all of them. Free yeah. climbing is like what he is doing is unroped free solo climbing. Yes. That to me, that would. Would you ever do that? Do you think you could build up the skills to do that? Well, you know, everyone does it at a certain point. I mean, you're free solo in the sidewalk, right? But, like, that's that's your current level. Um, if I was to go <laughs> sure. and climb something like um, – I climbed a mountain last uh, two years ago called Black Peak. It's, like, 5'2". If I was doing that alone, I would definitely not bring a rope. If I was with, like, some friends of mine, I definitely would not bring a rope. I have free solo some routes on Mount Hood that have ice. It's, like, alpine ice, too. It's like easy grade ice. That, that route that I told you about with the uh, the ice chip thing, um, you know, I'm, I would free solo that for sure. He is just doing it at like 512, 513, 514, which is insane because he is. What do you mean by 512, 513, and 5? What, what does that mean? Those are ratings of a, of a rock climb. So uh, okay. climbing is rated. There's many different rating systems, but one of the most common is the Yosemite Decimal System. Yep heard of it so if you were to if you were to go to it's like if, if, if you were to go to like a gym um you'd probably see stuff rated as low as like five four and i would say if you were a gym like a good beginner could probably be like 
outside, a good beginner could probably do like five eight, five nine, maybe five ten. So when you mean the gym, do you mean like a just like a rock climbing gym? A rock climbing gym, yeah. Okay, gotcha. And then um, the uh, you know he the, when you get to five ten, it starts going five ten A B C D, then five eleven A B C D, five twelve A B C D. He's I mean this dude's doing you know twelve A's. I don't I don't even know what the route that he did is rated at, but in that movie, but I'm sure he solos thirteen. That. Like that man, that man's is crazy. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't he know. is the best climber. I'm, other people have their idea of what the best climber is. Why, why, but he is one of the best, absolutely. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Why, why do you believe he's like, or not why do you believe? What do you think makes him different? Like, what attributes, whether it's his, oh, dude, I think he's calculated as hell. You know, when you like, when he's talking about, when he's talking about like how he like moved there to just like study the mountain and like, like how humble he is and, and how, um, just like his attitude towards it is incredible. You know, uh, he's like utterly committed and humble. And I think those two things can get you so far, even if you don't have a lot of natural ability, which he clearly does. Um, yeah, those two things, those two attributes can get you so far in life and almost anything. I remember listening to uh, the Joe Rogan podcast with him on it. And yeah. humble is definitely probably the top word I would associate after watching that podcast. Uh, the other and calculated being like maybe probably right up there being even. Um, in a good way, you know? Like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In a good way. Uh, but <laughs> what struck me that like, when errors happen in like mountain climbing is when people are getting like when they get lazy, when they've done a path that they've done before or a climb that they've done before. Uh, like, w- like that's when like climbers fall and they die or they hurt themselves. It's, it's when they just kind of get lazy. And uh, it struck me in such a way that I don't, I don't know if I could put it into words like, cause you could like in in an everyday job in everyday life you could make a, a significant amount of errors doing like mundane tasks that you've done before and on a mountain you make a small error that you know you on a climb you've done before that's it that's you, you're not coming back from it right mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, that's that's why people hire guides you know like that's we're, we're paid to double check, triple check everything so that other our clients don't have to worry about that or have to have those, those skills. You know, often it's like it, the, the time is the biggest payment that these people are, are having to give. Like, you know, a lot of our clients are very wealthy people. They can afford to go to Denali multiple times. Do they have the time to put in the energy and the, and the effort to train themselves to know how to do it themselves? No, that's where we come in. You know, have have you ever start thought about starting like your own mountaineering company or age? I, I, how does so? Are you like a, like contracted through them or are you like a full time employee? How how does that work? I'm a W two employee. What does that even mean? Um, I don't even really know. It's just a term I hear people say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about these things. I just climb. It's like uh, you know you fill out that form. Yeah. For the taxes. Um. No. So let's see. I. You know, I get paid every two weeks um, uh, per hour. Or I, actually, I actually get a day rate. Um, yeah. And then uh, when I do, like, international work, it's a contract. And I can negotiate that price, what I, what I get paid. Gotcha. That's a... And that can be based on, like, experience. So, like, if I, you know, I could do, like, a Denali or something like that, like a one Denali exhibition, and then, like, over the next three years, go out and do a bunch of other stuff. And then, like, two years later, they're like, we do another Denali. And I could be like, yeah, but now I've done this, 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 and this, and I really know what I'm doing. So I'd, like... Two thousand more dollars, please. <laughs> Two thousand more dollars, please. That's 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 pretty dope. Yeah. So do you, you just got some uh, some new equipment in? Uh, do you kind of want to go go through like what the equipment is, or and like maybe what it does real fast? Sure. Yeah. Um, the best, I think, by the best piece that I just picked up is this new backpack. Do today. you have an earring? Well, what's you say? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Are they both ears? Some European dudes. Uh, I was talking with some uh, some friends in um, uh, Argentina, and they were like, "You should put this earring in." So 
So wait, well, how long ago was did that happen? The earring? Yeah. I pierced my ears myself when I was in like eighth grade, but I didn't wear one ever. Oh, okay. That's funny. <laughs> All right, let's let's talk about some of the, the gear you have. I think that'd be pretty interesting the, to go through. Some like, of the gear I got, you know, like, got this I, nice backpack. Well, I remember this is a hyper light. This thing is dope. This how is, this is like I'm very excited. This is my baby. I'm not gonna destroy it at work like <laughs> all my other backpacks. How how important is it that uh your gear is to be as light as possible? I remember you telling me one time that um you're going on a trek, I think, with your girlfriend even, and you would take just like a regular tooth uh, uh, uh toothbrush and you would like cut it to where it's like just big enough so where you can like brush your teeth. Totally. You know, when I'm personally when I do personal climbing, I really care. Like when it's like just now when I did um, this mountain in New Mexico uh, five days ago, that I'm like, you know, I'll I'll cut corners and take risks on weight. Like mm, I don't need to bring the neg- like the, the zero degree backpack or the zero degree sleeping bag. Rather, I'll bring you know my negative or my my 15 degree or like my 20 degree, and I'll just either be cold or I'll sleep in a jacket. You know, sure. versus when I'm guiding we go at a slow pace yeah. and I have to carry so much of that crap anyway. Uh, then I'm just like, whatever. I don't even care. <laughs> I'll just carry everything. Yeah, um, gotcha. so like this backpack will never go to work with me. Really? This is like, I have, yeah. Oh yeah. I have like my work kit and that's like, um, a yeah. lot of gear that I get for free from the company. They just okay. give us like yeah. North face and rab and, and stuff like that. Like, I mean, not that that gear is bad, but just it's what those for free for me, and oh, I yeah. destroy that at work. Um, how fast do you great go? Great pieces. How do you go through? How like how fast do you go through like a backpack or like a, what's the most like uh, what what's the piece of equipment that you you will like have to get a new one like very soon? Yeah, yeah. I'd say boots are up there. Um, really, boots? Yeah. You want to see these? Hold up. I got my boots right here. Actually, from this last Mexico climb. Yeah, I you know I, I kind of find it surprising that you'd go through boots. Well, I mean, I guess oh, you're dude. you're using them. All, that's like the main thing that you're using, right? Every day. So this is uh this is a La Sportiva boot, the G2 SM. Um, it's pretty well destroyed. It's got no more sole left. I'm about to eat through this front part, which is where wow. the crampon clips on. Yeah. Um, it's pretty smooth on the bottom now. Um, it's not waterproof anymore, like at all. Wow. Uh, the zipper is getting kind of messed up, even though I keep oiling it and stuff. Uh, how, uh, really how, like, how long had, have you had the boots for? This is the second season on these. Yeah. Cause everything goes by seasons, not for, by years. Yeah. This is like, the, so I've put like probably eight months on Rainier and one month on Aconcagua with these. They're not meant for that. You know, like it's hard to find a boot that's like meant to be just abused yeah. um, at work. So like, yeah, equipment, we go through a lot. And that's obviously, that's our biggest expense as a guy. So like I'm, uh, these guys, uh, probably two years per pair of boots. Um, backpack, I'd say two years. How Sleeping ex- bags last a long time. How expensive are the boots in the back, uh, in the pack rather? We get deals on them. So those boots are about 850 bucks, but I get half off. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, that's not as bad. I mean, obviously, 800, 850 bucks. I mean, if you're spending that a, like every year, every two years, I mean, that, that adds up. Every two years, it does. It does add up. And that's, you know, that's something that we, uh, something that stresses us out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. What, what but, were, so that's why I say like, you know, I've got my kit that I get from work. It's like, you know, my, my, my hard shells and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll get a new one every season. Cause like, Okay. By the time the end of the season comes around, my rain jacket ain't waterproof anymore. Uh, things like that, you know, like my puppy jacket isn't warm that much like it was when it was new. But wow. then I have my stuff that I keep aside for my personal climbing, and that I keep holy. So what do you, what do you do with the the gear that's like no good anymore? Do you just throw it out, or can you like recycle I it? I give the homeless people. Do you really? Yeah. That they're that, always psyched to get backpacks. They love getting backpacks. Well, yeah, because you got to carry all, all your stuff. Mm-hmm. Layers. I, mean, I found a lot of guys out there who really like to get like a puffy jacket. Um, yeah, usually like end of the winter when yeah. I'm about to like start 
I like put away all my winter stuff and take out all my climbing season stuff. And I'm like, all right, I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need this. And I, I you know, whatever I've been living, I'm like, cool, go out and find someone to give it to you. Yeah. I mean, and I imagine you're giving, giving them very expensive stuff, right? I mean, is that, is that very Sometimes, common? But it's pretty thrashed. So, I mean, even thrash, I mean, like it's still going to do something. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. Getting the, getting a nice like a north face jacket that's been beaten up still pretty nice <laughs> way better than like a you know whatever yeah. they got at the moment is that is that very common uh throughout like the mountaineering community is when you just like have stuff that's just been expensed that you just give it to like like maybe a local in uh, a village or a town that you're in is that is that pretty yes common? definitely yeah absolutely like i'll stretch like just now we uh me and my client partner were down in mexico and we uh we had a rope that we were using and we just gave it to the local guides when we were done because uh, like especially in south america for some reason it's really hard to find like climbing gear like nice climbing shoes and ropes and like um like this type of shit yeah. um so if we have old stuff like yeah. hey you want these boots you want this helmet you want you know this backpack like i'm not gonna use it anymore and they'll get use out of it gotcha what like if you're in another country you uh, where are you getting gear like uh I mean, imagine, well, in like Washington, St- Washington State, or like um, in the United States in general, you go to what REI? Is that right? Well, as a professional in the industry, I get access to special deals from the company. So, like when well, yeah. I buy um, a carabiner from Black Diamond, I don't go to REI. I go directly to the company, and I get like sixty uh, percent off because they know that I'm going to use that stuff in front of clients, and I'll be well, like. Look how awesome this black diamond carabiner is. Well, and on top of that, I mean, you're going to go through them like candy. Yes. I mean, they know I'm going to be spending my money with them a lot, and I do. Gotcha. Especially Petzl. I buy a lot of Petzl stuff. Petzl, if you're listening. Okay. (laughs) If you're listening, deal with me. I got an Instagram. I'm on a podcast now. I love your your equipment. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Uh, So what about about for your clients? Where where are you going to direct them to go can they get like similar discounts through you guys or what you know there's a lot of like different ways that you can get those discounts um man like you know i i'm a ski patroller and like because of that i get like all these discounts on skis and like i would go to like a website like outdoorprolink.com yeah. um which i think is actually now called experticity <laughs> yeah um and you can like like, I, I want to say like a line worker can like get like those guys that like work on like the electricity. Oh, stuff, the, like, the lineman. Yeah. I think I'll probably get a discount too. Like, I mean, most outdoor jobs will, yeah. they can hook you up. Gotcha. That's find, so a, find a way to like, you know, fake it till you make it, find a way to like make them think that you are an outdoor professional. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I'm faking that I'm a legit podcaster, but you know, you know, what are you are. talking about? Is this a podcast? This this is a podcast, but I'm not are you being doing paid. This podcast, <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> no one has to know that. Well, uh, they're gonna know now. I shouldn't have said anything. You're getting paid an experience, hey, and which is having good times. Well, well, yeah, which is very invaluable. And like, so one of the biggest reasons why I started the podcast up was so I could talk to people who I may have not have gotten the chance to before, or like to really meet new people. And that's kind of why it started in Dallas was because I was kind of lonely and didn't have oh anyone man, to yeah, talk to. An and I was on an Island and I, I was, and then to like in the middle of being down, down there in March COVID hit. And well, it's, it's even more difficult to find like friends and like relationships post COVID. Right. Yeah. And so it was just like, it all hit perfectly. But honestly, I think it, it's actually helped me out in, in such a great way that, um, that I couldn't have even had seen uh, previously myself. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I mean, I, at least I got that. But So kind of kind of talking about COVID here a little bit, how, what was, I guess, your company's first response or like what, what was the, what happened? Have you had clients like on the mountain yeah. since COVID? Yeah. So COVID hit when I was, what was it, March? Something like March 20. Yeah. Like March, mid-March. March 20, maybe. Yeah. It really started to get quite bad. Um, now it's really, really bad. 
um, yeah, the, uh, the company basically canceled everything. Um, we canceled our Denali trips right away. So we always do a Denali in, uh, May and June and we canceled all those. And then we went month by month yeah. for Rainier and said, you know, June is canceled. We'll see about July. We're like May is canceled. We'll see about June. June is canceled. We'll see about July. And then we ended, we ended up Jeez. getting back to work June 29th. Um, and that's a few days after my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe next season you should come out and climb out near for your birthday. Hey, I'm not. I'm. I'm like. I don't know when I'll be getting day. Like when I'll have a like quite a few days off. But like honestly, whenever I can get like like a week off, I would more than love to come visit you, your girlfriend. Go possibly go on the side of a mountain and climb because I've never done it. Obviously, I don't have any experience, and to have someone like you to help me out, who's a good friend and whatnot, like that, that would like that that would be awesome to me. I'm just saying, dude. I would I would be I would be privileged to take you up, Alan, sir. <laughs> we should definitely go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we canceled all of our trips. Um, a lot of people got very very sad. Um, I pretty much spent two months on the couch doing nothing but running. Wow. And hanging out. And that was very hard for me. Um, but thankfully we were able to go back to work in July with new protocols. So we basically, um, you know, everywhere we go, we wear a mask. Um, we are like a buff over our face now, of course. Uh, we had to like change a couple of things this season. We have a, a personal tent for everybody. So wow. when we set up like high camp, um, or like uh, camp here, What's, what, what's high camp? High camp is uh, so like when you come with us on a mountain like Rainier, we'll have a camp already set up. So like when you get yeah. there, tents are already there. When you leave, they stay there, and the next group comes up and uses those same tents. Um, the company that I work for does probably I don't really know. They know like sixty Rainier climbs a summer. That's um, a lot. Each one is each one is three days long. So like on a Monday a trip goes up Tuesday, they go up to high camp Wednesday, they summit and on their way back down, they pass the next trip that's heading up. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So it's kind of constantly yeah. revolving, um, four guides per climb, per climb, eight clients per trip. Um, so this season, instead of having, um, it would be eight tents at high camp. We had 14. Wow. So you're just excessive. <laughs> I mean, you would have to. I mean, you don't have really any and to other main, choice. To maintain all of those, because they're constantly melting out of the snow, a um, lot of work. This was a hard season for us guys on Rainier. One yeah. of the companies that works that does Rainier trips didn't even, like, go this year. It just canceled this whole season and said, we'll see you next year. Wow. That's <laughs> insane. So, okay, actually, how have you – all right, where have you – since since March, where, where have you gone internationally? Just Mexico? Just Mexico. Cause, cause you, and that was just personal climbing. That was just me and my friend. Yeah, and you can't you can't go to Europe or anything, can you? Or nope. Asia. Wow. How do you feel about that? Not being able to like go over to those places. Mixed emotions, you know. It's like uh, I want us all to be safe. I want us all to be, um, you know, I want everyone to be healthy. Of course, I'm sad. I wish I could go and. Uh, see my friends there and climb the mountains that I want to climb and achieve those goals. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's sort of this idea in this game that like, if you're not pushing something, if you're not like on the edge of your skill level and like constantly moving forward, then you're going to get left behind. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you got to kind of constantly remind yourself during this that like, you are not the only one that is being held back. Everyone is in limbo together. And that that's, that's hard. Um, but if, you know, of course, so I want to go to those places and have fun, but, uh, you know, of course, I want everyone to be healthy. So this is, of course, the right thing to do is to, to not travel. And yeah, the only reason I was able to go to Orizaba is because I knew that there is no one there. It's the very beginning of the season. Okay. Um, so me and Ari, my client partner, were the only people at high, at, uh, at the hut, at the base of the mountain. Literally, we were the only ones there. Um, when I wow. summited, I was alone on the summit. <laughs> wow. That's, yeah. That's crazy. So and it was actually fun because we got to like climb separately. So I left, I let her like start like 40 minutes ahead of me. Yeah. Um, and then I started, so we're like soloing together kind of. Yeah. It was fun. 
That I, I would I would reckon is fun. I mean, being the only people on the mountain. I mean, that's. I, I mean, at, from an outsider to me, it seems like that would be something that people dream of. You know, happening. It's like kind of going to. Like the Statue of Liberty, or going to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and there's no one there but you. Have it to yourself. Yeah, you just have it to yourself. You can get all the pictures that you want to get, and it's not going to be crowded. You're not going to have a bunch of people in the photo. Like it's going to work out in your favor. And, and like for a mountaineer, I, I imagine that's like one of the coolest things you could do. So. It's pretty great, honestly. But, so this is a. So you said you're you're in the bet best shape of your life of sorts or in the better shape of your life. Um, when I met you, you had completed the Chicago marathon. <laughs> yeah. And what, what was your time for the marathon? Uh, when did you, I've done three of them. So if you met me in 2015, it was three hours, four minutes. So what's your best time for the marathon? That's, that's it. Three hours, three hours, like dead yeah. even. Three hours, four minutes. Yeah. Three hours, four minutes. And you were so stoked because you had qualified for the Boston Marathon. Like, Yeah. Do you think, like, now you'd be able to, like, say if you had to re-qualify or, like, how long is the qualification good for? Oh, man. I don't know. I think it might be. I think it's year by year. Gotcha. I think it's year by year. Gotcha. So do you th- do you think you could go? C- so you'd have to right, requalify right now, off the couch. Yeah. Ah, uh, no, probably not. I'm not in marathon shape. That's different. I think your your fitness is like fitness for different things is different. Like I am in great climbing shape right now. Yeah. I just climbed that route on Orizaba in two hours eighteen minutes. I think the record for it is an hour and thirty four minutes. Wow. I, most people do it. Like if I was to do it with clients, I would imagine it would take us about seven hours. Wow, that is a huge difference. Yeah, but I don't think I could run a marathon that quickly. But it's like, uh, you know, just doing this job, it's like living on a stair stepper for like all summer <laughs> long. It's like you get on a stair stepper every day with like a 30 pound or more pack and you hang out on that thing for like five, six hours. I mean, even when I met you, you had like massive quads. Do you think your quads are even bigger now? I want to talk about my quads. Mm. <laughs> you're like you start talking about my know. quads is gonna I'm get a little like, sexual here bud i think i weigh about the same honestly i'm like 210 right now i mean that how tall are you you're probably you're probably six, six foot. foot you're not six foot you're taller than me i'm six foot i'm six foot one dude then i think you're taller than me my man i could have swore you were like six two six three let's go with that <laughs> all right so <laughs> I got like two more questions left for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I hope one of them's not a sad question. Uh, do you still have your cat that like you had in Terre Haute? No, I don't. I left it with uh, I left it with my girlfriend at the time. Okay. And I think she gave it to her mom or something like that. Gotcha. Um, and then the 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 last question that I have for you is that thing. Yeah. That cat was a dope cat. It was adorable. Dude, you 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 would show me you would like flick like little hair bands and then it would go chase after it and like bring it back hanging in its mouth. That cat played fetch. Yeah, that that cat was dope. And yeah, it would actually bring it back to you and just like go like grab it and then go to a corner. Uh that oh, cat great. What was the cat's name again? Grizzly. Grizzly? Grizzly? Like Dude, a bear? I Oh my gosh. I Are remember Grizzly bear. I'm not going to sit here to lie to you, but I have definitely like good memories of just like hanging out with you in your apartment with the cat. And then, uh, actually I think the first time I had asparagus or the first time that I actually like enjoyed asparagus was when you made it on the grill outside on the porch. Dude. I ah, love grilling. That's important thing to me right now is eating. Well, how are you doing with that during COVID? Uh, I've actually, well, well, since I've moved to Bloomington, I've been I've been eating like really well. So nice. I've been taking care of myself. I actually, so I was I can't remember. I might have been around two forty five when you met me of sorts. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe two thirty, um, and then I went all the way up to two sixty. Dang! And, oh yeah. So right now, thick boy. Oh, I'm thick boy. Big thick boy here. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, right about, so I've, I've lost like seven pounds. I'm at two fifty three, but I, I had, uh, so after you had graduated, I had got all the way down to two thirty, And then, um, I, so like when I was in Texas, I wouldn't say like it was 10, 15 pounds of muscle, but it was 10, 15 pounds of pure man. There you go. Um, uh, so I was probably 240, 245 ish. And then I think, uh, carry it like you're 220, carry it like you're 220. That's right. Um, and then I think, uh, I, I got up to, so the pandemic, uh, like initially you kind of hurt like, like the weight and all that stuff. Cause it was just like, like I, I was living back in Terre Haute and I didn't like have like great facilities to like cook and make my own meals and all that good stuff. And so I was like having to eat out a bunch and it like, cause I didn't have like my own plate. Yeah. It was just hard. And then, so I got back up to, <laughs> to 260. Uh, but literally, literally right after this podcast, I'm going to go run like four miles. So yeah. yeah, I'll get four miles in. The goal is to get down to 205. And I think I could do that pretty, pretty easily. I think, uh, which obviously it's losing like 50 pounds, but I think, uh, I think I could do it pretty fast. So. Can we chiseled, bro. Two oh five. Yeah. I don't know about chiseled, but I th- like I think that would be a like a good weight for me. So you're pretty jacked if you get two oh five. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely need to lose the weight before I like try to like gain anything really. Because oh yeah, definitely. Because like I I feel like I always had the problem of like anytime I was lo- like like doing a- like actual weights, it was like. Like I was gaining weight, but like I felt smaller. But it was—I I don't know how to describe it. I have like fake muscles almost. Like, like I could, like I can work out and just do much of like, I can just bench, squat, all like any of the dumbbell exercises, and I'll look pretty good. But I'm not as strong as I look. So yes, you are. <laughs> no, I'm no. <laughs> you rascal. Um uh, gotcha. So so my last question for you and kinda Shoot. just to to wrap things up. You like that? That was all is that your catch sign? I wish. It's like probably, you're fired. Uh, you're fired. It's probably taken though. <laughs> um so my, my my last question is for you. Well, well bearing that there is like no accidents on the mountains. Mm-hmm. When do you think, cause obviously it's got to come to an end at some point, right? Like when do you think it, like you're going to like hang up your gear, your boots or whatever. And maybe, maybe you just do like more trips that are really just for you. You're not doing client, client trips and whatnot, but how long do you think you could like maintain a career in mountaineering and climbing and whatnot before you kind of have to give it up? Cause like they're like, cause you know, your body's going to wear out sometime. Like when do you, when do you think that would be? I think, you know, we got a lot of guides who are working into their sixties. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Vern Tejas, Ed Feasters, David Gottlieb, um, Craig Van Hoy, Craig John. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of guys out there who are older. Um, I think a lot of people just get burned out on it eventually. It's, it's a lot of mental strain, like dealing with clients every day and doing the same routes all the time. And, and it, you know, at a certain point, it, 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 it's hard to make sure – it's hard to it's hard to stay having a good time. Yeah. Like, I don't feel it yet. Sometimes I do. Um, but, like, you know, climbing is not always the most fun thing in the world, you know, like – it's you know sometimes it's like it's raining or it's windy or it's cold as hell and you're not feeling great. Yeah. Um, and it makes those days so hard when you're burned out, like when you're when it's been like a long season and you're just like, yeah. All right, here we go, twentieth Rainier trip. We got this. You know, it's like it's a mental battle. Um, and and it and it makes everything else not quite as fun when it's when that's like your chosen activity. You know. Um, yeah. You know, like when I ski patrol, I ski. You know, I'm on skis five days a week. And when I take my days off, I don't want to be anywhere near my ski boots. <laughs> wow. I want to go and climb or lift weights or do or sit on the couch. Sometimes it's been a hard week, just lay on the couch all day and eat pizza and sleep. <laughs> um, 
Sometimes the weeks are hard, man. You're getting up early. Oh, I get it. I get it. Injured and messed up. Uh, no, I, I see myself guiding into my 50s. Uh, wow. Especially if I can get on that Rainier train where I can go to Rainier, or I'm sorry, Everest uh, every year. Um, you know, the paycheck's good. The experience is good. Um, I don't see any reason that I would need to stop, find a woman who can deal with me being gone for a couple months a year, and uh, yeah. try to have as normal a life as possible in that regard. So, kind of going off of like normal life, uh, do you ever see yourself having kids? Like, is that even in the, in the cards? Because, like, I imagine if it was, like, it'd be really hard to like maintain uh, like relationships with your kids when you're gone. Dude, I would so love much. to have kids. Yeah, I would love to have kids, you know. That's 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 like probably one of the one of the bigger driving forces in my life that I that I think about in terms of setting myself up for the future. Like what do I want to what what do I want to have money for? Where do I want to be? Where do I want to be living when it, when that time comes? Um, so yeah, I, I I do definitely want to have kids and, and uh, I think my life would definitely change during that time. Um, but it's something I'll be ready for. Yeah. I know a lot of guys don't want to have kids, like my client partner um, that I was just with, um, I don't want to quote her on this, but I'm pretty sure she does not want to have kids. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like we had that conversation one day. Um, yeah. Which is like totally understandable. It's like, you know, you're doing, you're doing your thing. Yeah. Why? We're so overpopulated anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, it's always been like, so I just had a, a, a pilot on the show. I didn't ask him if he wanted to have kids and whatnot, but um, I did ask him how he tries to maintain somewhat of a normal life because there are stretches where, I mean, maybe not like a few months like you, but he's gone for five days at a time, seven days, 10 days, maybe just the day it could really vary. And this the schedule is like very sporadic, maybe like yours is. And... Mm -hmm comparing those schedules to some of that's like, I guess more typical of like what I'm doing. Um, it just seems like it would be very hard. Like it just seems like there's just not enough hours in the day. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it's going to be tough when it happens, like when it's time to have that conversation with whoever I'm with. And, but, uh, it's definitely one that I want to have yeah. and yeah, it will be tough. It will be, it will be tough. Yeah. Cause I imagine, cause like, like when I, when I met you in college, you definitely seem happy, but like having this conversation that I've had with you, um, you seem like you're in, like even in the middle of a pandemic, you're in great spirits. You absolutely love what you're doing. And I cannot express to you enough that I, I love that you like are loving what you're doing. And like, you found that thing at least for right now. And that thing that you love doing could change. And you know, that's a very big possibility. Um, and this is one of the things that I, I enjoy doing myself, but I haven't yet figured out, you know, how to make money from it. But, you know, eventually, I, hopefully I'll get there. So, like, maybe I could, like, have more free time to where maybe this this could be my full-time job, right? And then I could come out on, like, a week or two, come on an excur excursion with you or, like, even if it's not going out on, a, like, an excursion, maybe just, like, having more time to do the stuff that I want to do than do the stuff that I have to do. So. Hell yeah, man. I mean, I think you'll definitely get there. There's, you know, it's like Alex, it's like Alex Honnold, dude. Like be humble, be calculated, be motivated. And you can find that way. You know, like I, I, I thought when I was graduating, I was like, all right, but in the next five years, I want to be a guide and a patroller. And I made that happen in a year. <laughs> And if you put your mind to that, you find that the world is much smaller than you think it is getting in. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, the, the biggest, like, like from, from the conversation that we've had today, the biggest like piece of information or like, uh, how do I want to say this? The biggest, I guess, piece of information. Cause that my words escaped me. Um, to give to someone who is trying to pursue what they're wanting to do or loving to do is like you literally found a guy at a ski resort that you knew he would be at to go and talk to him, to have a conversation with him. 
and to learn from him and to help you get a foot in the door. Like by doing that and just talking to people and just taking the chance, of course, like I, I never had any doubt like you would have found what you were doing. I, I doubted what you would do because I had no idea. And, uh, but like that to me is so like valuable to like anyone who's trying to do anything, whether it's mountaineering, podcasting, etc. It's just like, it's, it's very powerful. So I, I just, if, if I just think have, it's cool. I think, I think if you have a, if you have a skill that you think is worth cultivating, I mean, you owe it to yourself to like take that as far as you can and like never, mm-hmm. never like never have self doubt, never think, Oh, I, I'm not qualified yet. You know, like, especially the, I'm not qualified yet. <laughs> that is such a bullshit excuse. <laughs> And yeah, I've so gotten that when, when just seeking normal jobs. Like I've I've said to myself, I'm not qualified. Why am I here doing this? And then I end up oh. doing that thing that I was I didn't think I was qualified for. Right, dude, you fake it until you make it. That is such a real statement. Like yeah. when people say that, it is so real. I mean, you like the 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 year. So when I went to to work at Talos and I met that guy, the year the summer before that winter. Um, I had done like this big, long road trip and I just drove up the West coast, climbing a lot of these big uh, peaks out here on the West coast and stopping into three different guide services to like put a face to the name and shake their hand and say, Hey, I'm Matt. I want to be trying out next season. So RMI, um, Alpine Ascents, IMG and, um, four of them actually. And, uh, one on Shasta, I stopped in and said hi to you. And like, you do those things. Even if you don't think you can make it. Like I didn't think I was like, man, I'm not qualified. I'm not like these other guys, but like, I'm going to try. Yeah. Like you miss every shot. You don't take, you get in there and you do it. And yeah. you know, I did that and I take a next step. Then you take a next step. Like don't give up on yourself. Yeah. It seems, it seems like the, the cliches, they, they're like, they just don't work. But like when you actually practice them, like you see that, Oh, that, that actually does make sense. Like doing those things will help you. It will get you in the door. It will lead to like, a, like where you're one, one wanting to be. Right. So yeah, dude, you make your own luck in this world. Yeah. No kidding. So kind of, man, this, I, I, I absolutely love talking to you. This is like absolutely spectacular. <laughs> Thanks, I, I just, I can't believe how awesome this has been. Um, kind of, like what is uh like your piece of advice for someone who's trying to you know be a mountaineer and like other than doing what you did like because that that's a great thing that you did um just like a little piece of advice and then like what do you think could help you know anyone in 2020 uh, to get through what what they're getting or uh, what they're going through and like what is what do you think is like one way or, or some multiple ways that you could or that people could get back into climbing and that they, they could come and be on your trips and do the things that you're doing can you just kind of do you think that's the that's biggest it. thing if you yeah if you're trying to yeah stay in shape stay in shape in whatever way you can but like run bike yeah. swim, climb, do those things that keep you in shape. Cause if you're in shape, your ability to get better at things is so much higher than if yeah. you're not in shape. This has been your full chat podcast. My name is Eric Roberts and you just heard from Matt Rosenberg, mountaineer, awesome guy, great person. And, uh, just a phenomenal human being. If you like this podcast, like, subscribe, and share. Thank you for watching.